Brothers and sisters, we've both read and heard numerous times. That Satan the devil is the enemy. He's the deceiver and the father of the lie. Yet, I fear some of us may have, or are allowing our senses to be dull regarding that unchangeable fact. Instead of following God's instruction to be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8 When you go to the zoo and you see a lion, you don't desire to be in its habitat when it's hungry, do you? Most of us have seen nature shows where a lion is pursuing a gazelle, or a zebra, or maybe a young giraffe, and when he catches it, what happens? Yes, he devours it. So, the word of God is telling us, or rather vividly warning us, that Satan the devil is seeking whom he may devour. And I'm here to tell you, he goes about it in many different ways. Often, his approach is so subtle, and so well disguised. Because remember, he is the deceiver, that you won't even know what's going on, unless, you are on the lookout. This evil, wicked, enemy of mankind, is looking for someone weak. Someone who is a spiritual babe. Just like a young gazelle, or zebra, or giraffe. He's looking for someone who's hanging out there on the fringe, who has one foot still in the world, or who is willing to compromise. He's looking for anyone who will give him the opportunity to devour them. He was looking back then in the garden, and he's looking today. Which is why we must constantly be on the lookout for him, and every devious approach he has, just as much as he is on the lookout for us. Today's teaching is intended to help each and every one of us do just that. I know there are many members of this congregation who are also members of fraternities and sororities. I also understand that many of these organizations have had a positive impact on various communities by providing programs which have truly served many in need. Many fraternities and sororities have been instrumental in effecting social change on a national level. However, in spite of their good works, we are required to closely examine them and view them from the perspective of God's Word, because God's Word is the final authority, and obeying His Word is how we move ourselves into right standing and stay in right standing with Him. Participation in Greek life, as it's known, typically starts as an undergraduate in college. When young adults pledge to a fraternity or sorority which is represented by a Greek letter, and or number, you must be initiated, which often includes some form of hazing in order to cross into the organization. According to documented reports, hazing can span anything from being wooded, which entails being beaten until the initiate experiences welts and bleeding, to being beaten with a baseball bat. And the beating isn't necessarily a one-time thing. It would certainly be bad enough if it were, but several fraternity members were arrested for severely beating pledges over a two-month span of time. In another case, a pledge who suffered from asthma was forced to run for miles and died as a result of that senselessness. And yet, another situation, an initiate filed suit for severe kidney failure as a result of hazing in one their case. Other bizarre rituals include toxic amounts of underage drinking that have regrettably ended in many deaths. These tragic occurrences are the result of the trauma bonding practices, which are common amongst fraternities and sororities. But they aren't the only groups that use that practice. As an example, when someone wants to join a gang, they don't just go up to the gang leader and request an application, complete it and then hand over some money for their monthly dues. No. In order for someone to join a gang, they have to be physically beaten in. And those beatings are savage. Now, beyond the physical risks of pledging, which should be enough of a deterrent, there are serious spiritual dangers as well, which begin at the time the oath is taken. To better understand this danger, it's important for you to know that Greek letter organizations, whether it be a fraternity or a sorority, have a deity, a Greek god or goddess attached to it, such as Nike, Zeus, Aphrodite, Pan, Minerva, and Hades as examples. Oaths are stated while bowing down before some form of altar to a pagan god. Did you catch that? A good question to ask is why are Greek gods associated with fraternities and sororities? And an even better question is, why is it when someone pledges to these groups, their oath, according to the organization, can never be broken, and will follow them until final judgment, which we know means judgment day. Think about that. Now as adults, we can, and do enter into many different types of agreements, such as contracts, 
and even an oath when one enlists in military service, or contracts pertaining to employment, or regarding services that we provide or receive. And when you make a major purchase such as a house or a car, or start a business. When someone becomes involved in the legal system by way of a lawsuit, or even due to a criminal offense, there are agreements, and or contracts, which are binding. When a couple marry, that too is a contractual agreement, as well as a covenant, they give an oath which is recognized by God. But here's the crucial core of the matter, whether it's marriage, or any other form of agreement, covenant, or oath. A person's death is the point at which that agreement, contract, or oath, is nullified, and no longer in effect. Except, the oath of pledges to a fraternity or sorority. So, they are saying even once you die, you are still connected, and remain attached or bound to that organization and its deity. Now, what does that sound like to you? I'll tell you what it is. It's a supernatural oath, agreement, and covenant, with supernatural beings. The only thing other than our covenant with the Most High God through His Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, that is still binding, even after death, is a covenant, with another spirit entity, a God. And that, is the God of this world, the enemy Satan, and his demon hordes, who masquerade as mythological gods and goddesses, but in fact, are very much real. Who or what else can a person come into agreement with, swear an oath to, and have that agreement fully binding until Judgment Day? There is no one else. Because on Judgment Day, the Most High God, will, and must, recognize all covenants that have not been denounced, and renounced, and proceed to act accordingly. Now, just imagine, you've made this pledge, an oath that you supposedly cannot be released from, and it's Judgment Day. There you are, standing before Jesus, who according to 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1, will judge the living and the dead. There you are facing judgment before God Almighty and His millions of angels watching, and you think you're going to hear, well done good and faithful servant. But here comes Satan, as Revelation 12:10 calls him, the accuser of the brethren, to remind both you and Jesus, that you willingly uttered an oath, and came into agreement, and established the covenant, with, whichever of those unclean spirits represented your particular Greek house. And that oath, that pledge, has stayed with you until right then. Because not even death, could separate you from it. Brothers and sisters, the enemy knows scripture very well. He knows God's first commandment to have no other gods before him, which is found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, which is why he is so devious, in how he tricks people. And he also knows the penalty of those who fall for his deceptions. Why do you think he is so relentless? So that he can just exhaust himself and get a good night's sleep? No. It's because he wants you with him. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41 states the eternal fire was prepared for the devil and his angels, and he knows that's where he is ultimately going to end up. So, if you have not renounced, denounced, and come out of agreement with those organizations, the hair on the back of your neck should be standing up right now. Because God is not playing a game with you. And the fact is, neither is Satan. And it's high time for the church to fully understand that truth. Your decisions, your actions, and who you have come into agreement with, has eternal ramifications. Why do you think when you pledge those houses, your oath follows you beyond death, right to judgment day? Could it be so that the enemy, who seeks to devour you, can claim you as his? Could it be, so that he can insist, because you gave him the legal right, to say, they pledged themselves to me, and since they never denounced and renounced that oath, they are still in agreement with it. And they belong to me. If that isn't terrifying, then I don't know what is. I'm sure some of you may be thinking, but pastor, what about 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 which says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. God's word is truth, but first you must repent, otherwise, you are not a new creation. You are still the same person you've always been. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, God is telling us we must be transformed. And let's also consider, Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Here, God is telling us to repent, which is changing direction from our sins and wrongdoings, 
and also to be converted, which is the past tense of the word convert. So we see, God has repeatedly told us, we must change, we must repent. We cannot be the same in our appearance, meaning the same ungodly behaviors, or character, as we were when we were in the world. Nor can we maintain the same function with regard to spiritual things. We are required to make that dramatic change, and that change should be so dramatic, that anyone observing you, and how you live your life, would notice it. I know walking away from your fraternity or sorority isn't necessarily an easy task. Many of you have dedicated a great deal of time and effort to the initiatives of these organizations, as well as cultivating relationships that you value. But I ask that you focus on God's instruction found in the book of 1 John, the second chapter, and verses 15 through 17 which says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. You may be wondering about your affiliation with fraternities and sororities, and if God will receive you after making those pledges. Well, let's read 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Psalm 86 verse 5 states that God is good and ready to forgive, and that He is abundant in mercy to all those who call upon Him. Only the Most High God deserves our pledge. Amen. Hello? Hey, I couldn't believe what Pastor was saying about fraternities and sororities today. Does he actually think we pledge to Greek gods? That's absolutely ridiculous. I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, not Zeus. It's not about whether you believe in Zeus or not, the fact is, Zeus is the deity attached to that organization, and is venerated by it. Otherwise, why have an attachment to a Greek god at all? And as Christians, we must honor our god who is the Most High, who told us to have no other gods before him. Well, it's not like pledges are worshipping Zeus. It's more like a mascot, you know, like sports teams have. That's all it is. I'm sure those organizations would like for you to believe that and I can see they have you fully convinced that that's all it is. Of course it is. Just look at all the good that these organizations do. They provide measurable benefits to the communities they serve. I pledged so that I would always be successful in my career, and I wanted to be a part of something which had positive measurable impact in people's lives. No one is accusing these organizations of not having a positive impact. But the issue is, their identity and allegiance is to false gods, and there is no getting around it. Before today, have you ever wondered why Greek deities are attached to fraternities and sororities? Well, I can see you agree with the pastor, but I don't. I think he is totally off base with this one. I'm not going to denounce my pledge, because so much good has come from it, and aren't we supposed to do good towards others? Hello? Hey, I was wondering what you and your husband thought about the sermon today. That was certainly a lot to think about wasn't it? My husband and I were discussing the points Pastor made on the way home. So what do you guys think? Do you agree with what Pastor said? Absolutely. There is no arguing the scriptural points he made. God's word is very clear on these matters. Well, you and your husband are members of a sorority and a fraternity. You guys have built a successful business with the support and benefit of your Greek houses. Aren't most of your clients, at least the biggest ones, pledges also? Do you mean to tell me, you're going to give all that up? Because you know once you denounce and renounce your pledges, it will mean nothing but problems for you both. You'll lose everything you've built. Your business could even go under. Is it worth it? We're well aware of all the consequences of denouncing our pledges. But more importantly, we're well aware of the position we are placing ourselves in with God Almighty, our Creator, and those consequences if we don't. What about the relationships you share with other pledges? Those are real bonds of brotherhood and sisterhood. They go back many years and are just as genuine as the relationships you have with family, sometimes more so. 
I understand what you are saying. However, being in the body of Christ provides us with all the family we need. And the truth is, you know as well as I do, there is a lot of drunkenness, sexual uncleanness, and other ungodly behavior at practically all the parties and events hosted by these groups. And quite often, pledges have engaged in criminal activity, which has led to arrests and convictions. Well, you have to use good judgment about who you associate with. But other than that, I don't think it really matters to God if we are members of these organizations. Besides, it's such a small part of our lives when you compare it to how much time we spend in church. And what about all the congregation initiatives we are able to financially support, because of our affiliations with these organizations and other pledges? Just think of how much the church has profited from the money earned, by people in fraternities and sororities. I've made generous donations, and I know you and others have too. I hope you don't think financial support can buy God's favor, or that the church should quietly allow the association of Greek gods in the congregations of our Lord. The church doesn't owe anything to those organizations, God is the creator of gold, and it all belongs to him anyway. All I'm trying to say, is that fraternities and sororities aren't all bad, and churches have benefited from them too. Doesn't that count for something? 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 14 through 15 says, And no wonder. For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So, all their giving doesn't change what they represent. I can see you are going to follow what the pastor said no matter what. My husband and I are very grateful pastor did such an excellent teaching on this today. We pledged years ago. And would never want to stand before our Savior at the time of judgment, and still be bound to an oath to unclean spirits. But we're Christians, so that pledge doesn't apply to us because of Jesus. Any sins or transgressions that we commit are done away with because of Jesus. Doesn't Romans chapter 8 verse 1 say, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus? Yes, that's the first part of that verse, the rest of it says, Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So, if you are walking according to the Spirit, then there is no condemnation. But do you really think having any association with a Greek god or goddess, is walking in accordance to the Spirit of God? I really think Pastor has blown this whole thing out of proportion, and I think he's wrong about this. My sorority has a wonderful track record of serving others, and I'm pretty sure Jesus told us we are supposed to serve. So I can't see that as being out of line. Besides that, my sorority sisters have done a lot for me, and these are people I genuinely love. Then I guess you're going to have to decide who you love more. We're going to follow what the Word of God says no matter what. James chapter 1 verse 27 says, To keep oneself unspotted from the world. And we don't get to pick and choose when we want to obey, and when we don't. I suggest you pray and ask for discernment. Then you'll see the Holy Spirit will lead you to our gracious God, who loves us all and wants us with Him. I'm going to pray for you. And hope that your heart doesn't become hardened and that you will be able to receive the truth that God is showing you. My husband and I have already agreed. And as for me and our household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua chapter 24 verse 15. Please, take everything that was said in this video to the Lord in prayer. It can be difficult leaving fraternities and sororities behind. But we must serve our Lord in spirit and in truth. Remember, only He is our God. Thanks for watching and God bless you.